I'll let you go first. All right. Uh, I'm Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the juror for this year's Salina Biennial. And I'm Bart Vargas. I'm an educator, and I'm an artist and educator from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we're here to talk about Bart's piece. Um, my contribution to the Salina Biennial is a map that I call "There are there are places on the map that do not exist." Um, that title originates from um, sort of the economic disparity of technology. We talk about the World Wide Web and a lot of language of technology is very democratic. Like we say the internet is a worldwide thing when actually um, economic, technological disparity follows economic disparity. If we mapped who had technology or if we mapped the internet and where the internet was coming from, places like Africa, which are some of the largest continents, would diminish and become like some of the smallest places. You know, parts of Asia, parts of South America would almost disappear. Um, and then places like New Zealand and um, the United States would get huge. Um, what about Antarctica? Antarctica, I tried to make this as, it's as accurate as a flat distorted map would be. And so I tried to include Antarctica. Um, there are some people around the coast that are using technology, but there's not very many people there. So. <laughs> Per capita, it's probably pretty technologically advanced. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Human capita. yeah they, they have the access to the technology. Um, one of the biggest statements people make about this map is they ask why it's upside down. Um, I'd ask, I, I try to ask them why they think it's upside down. Um, half of the maps of the world, like maps made in Australia, maps made in parts of Africa, maps made in South America, have this orientation because the people in the Southern Hemisphere have this idea that they're on top. Um, uh, north, south, east, and west in most languages don't translate to things like up, down, left, right. They are, they are the cardinal directions. They're something completely, they're orientation directions. Um, and so this deals a little bit with language and a little bit with uh, um, colonialism and imperialism. Um, when I showed work like this in China, I would never thought that, but when I spoke with Chinese artists and Chinese curators, they were asking, why does all technology have to be in one language when the world shares 6,000 languages? Um, when children tell me this is upside down, um, I ask them about their very first toys, like one of our first toys is a ball, and the earth is supposed to be a sphere. Um, I ask them when they, ha when they go home and they play with their ball, does it have a top or a bottom? And then I compare that to the earth. Um, none of those arguments work on my mom. She still tells me it's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but living in, America, living in the United States, we live in the Northern Hemisphere. We tend to think of all of our maps have the orientation with us on top. And so that's why people perceive the map as upside down. I also like it that Africa is kind of centered. It shifts the center in multiple ways, both in relation North, south, and east, west, because we also so many of our directions. You know, like if you think of the Middle East, right? It's in the middle. Only if you think of Europe as also being in the middle, and then relative to that, you know, certain parts of Asia are the far east, right? Because yeah. they're far from Europe. And so I like how this disorients you in multiple ways. And for me, it was important to put Africa in the center because that's we're an ancient species on this planet. That you know, our origin is in prehistory, but we came our species originally came from Africa, so I think that's a good place to start right in the middle. Um, the, orient the orientation of the keys change at the equator, so um, the keys, when you look at them, they read uh, upright above the equator here, and then they're upside down below the equator. On each of the five panels, I've signed my name with the year I made it in 2019 on the equator, so you can find that. But then there are um, all these keyboards were collected from the Omaha um, greater metro area and Lincoln, Nebraska. And we had a couple people donate um, laptops and keyboards from deceased family members. And so I put a couple of their names as a memorial within the piece as well. Do you feel like this is an eulogy for technological obsolescence too? Um, I'm not sure if it's a eulogy. I think it's uh, like e-waste is a is probably a global problem at this state. Like we're so obsessed with the new like 
we use technology very not very long like we take between like a ton like we take between 1500 pounds of material to a ton of material raw materials to make a computer tower to make a laptop but then statistics show that that laptop will be less used less than two years before it's upgraded and replaced and then it ends up at an electronic recycler and then i i'm not necessarily using the electronic components i'm taking like the plastic i'm essentially treating the plastic keys as mosaic tiles and then I build sculptures and objects and maps and so forth with those things. Um, a, lot of my, a lot of my practice comes out of salvaging materials or collecting materials that, um, we talk about how limited resources are, but we have so much stuff that we're just not, we're just not using very long. Like we treat, it, we treat everything disposably and I try, to, I try to say things with those materials. Um, yeah, like other, other works speak more directly to that. Like plastic has been, um, plastic is a human invention. Um, hydrocarbon molecules have never been in that orientation until we put them in that orientation. It's actually an immortal molecule that, that'll live on indefinitely. They say it'll break down in 30,000 years, but that's if something that comes along in 30,000 years. We've had this material for less, a little bit more than 100 years, but in that time period, we've literally covered our planet in plastics. Um, 20 years ago, the United Nations did an ocean oceanographic survey, which estimated that there was 100,000 pieces of plastic per square mile of ocean. And with the world being two thirds ocean, like that's a lot of plastic that's floating out in the ocean. And, and you know, a lot of people say like, well, where did it all come from? Um, a lot of it came from our cities. Like Omaha is known to be a polluter of the Atlantic Ocean. When someone's driving down our main street Dodge Road, and they're eating a bag of Cheetos and drinking a Pepsi bottle, they might throw it out the window and litter Omaha. But within months to a year, you know, that Pepsi bottle will get crushed. You know, it'll rain, it'll snow, the snow will melt. You know, that trash gets washed into our storm sewers. The, the storm sewers take them to our creek system. The creek system takes it to the Missouri River. The Missouri River takes it to the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River will ultimately take that plastic to the Gulf of Mexico. And so we believe uh, that the natural water cycle of the planet is actually taking our plastic to the oceans and 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 there's so many of us and and like people just look at me like I'm some kind of weirdo when I say Omaha pollutes the Atlantic Ocean because like we're relatively in the middle of the North American continent um, but it's it's the natural water cycle where we think most of that stuff comes from um, one of the things I was attracted to your biennial is like you wanted to show contemporary art of this time zone, the, the central time zone of the United States. I think when people talk about contemporary art, they tend to talk about places like the coast, like Los Angeles, New York, or Chicago as like the art centers of our country. Um, like I try to explain to my students in, in community college that contemporary art is art of its time. Like technically all art is contemporary just because it's not happening in Los Angeles, just because it's not happening in New York or Paris or London or Berlin, doesn't mean that it's not contemporary art. Um, I think, to me at its essence, art is communication. Like we're so used to talking through words and text, but artists talk through images and objects. And we try to say a lot of different things that way. Um, I feel like everybody's voice is valid, you know, whether we live here in the middle of the country or whether we live in a major city. Um, it says something, like all these, everything that we're making says something about the time that we live in. Um.